Martha, thank you so much for making the time to be here. Edmonton and University of Alberta are really considered one of the foundational places for reinforcement learning. So what exactly is your area of research interest? A particular focus of mine within the reinforcement learning problem is about representation learning. And so representation learning is actually a larger problem in machine learning. It's about how do we learn functions to approximate or predict things in our world. So it's a formalism for trial and error interaction where an agent is in some part of its environment, it gets to take an action, and its action has an effect where it moves to some new part of the environment. Say for example, it steps forward, and it might get a reward for doing good or bad things. So on every step it gets a reward, but its goal is to maximize long-term reward. So it really wants to take actions now that are gonna result in lots of reward into the future. So in one form of representation learning, it is what I described. We'd like to be able to specify what our function should look like because in machine learning and reinforcement learning, we always have some input observations or some input, for, say, from our world, and we'd like to be able to, say, predict some target. So let's say I have some input, some camera image of my world right now, and I'd like to predict how many steps is it until I were to reach, I reach that wall. If I were just to try to learn a really simple function of that, that would be a pretty hard function to learn because there's all these things that I should ignore and not pay attention to, uh, and in general, it's this big, dense representation. Rather, we'd like to take that and transform it into pulling out the most important features of that input to be able to make it easier to make predictions about the things we'd really like to make predictions about. And then the second part of representation learning that really comes up in reinforcement learning particularly is this idea of dealing with partial observability. A big problem in artificial intelligence is that we don't get to see everything that is happening. I don't get to see the state of the world. I see this very limited window into what is going on. But the wonderful thing about reinforcement learning is you can, you know, your agent gets to move around and has all these temporal dependencies and it can actually build up more information than just from its immediate observations. So the example I always like to use for something like this is that you're blindfolded and you're in the middle of a room. If someone were to ask you how far away you, are you from the wall, they would not be able to answer that question. But now if you're allowed to walk around for a while and you touch a wall, then now you know where that wall is. You still can't see where it is, so the information isn't given to you from your inputs, but you can build up this knowledge about what's actually going on around you just from interacting with the world. So both of these components really make up the representation learning question. How do we pick a functional form and how do we deal with partial observability? There are a lot of people who have conflated reinforcement learning with robotics. Um, I think probably for the reason that RL is linked to autonomous agents and people think of robots when they try to conceive of autonomous agents. What's the actual reality of that link? Well, one thing is true is what you said, is that robotics, I think, is a really great motivational platform for reinforcement learning as a formalism for AI. You, know, you have these robots, they have to actually move around in their environments in this very free way, and it's hard to imagine exactly hard coding in a lot of behavior. So you could program for a robot how it should behave uh, in a minefield, for example, to go deactivate mines, but then it might actually run into situations you didn't anticipate and now you wanted to be able to adapt to those situations. So when we think of robotics, we do often think we need to have these agents adapt, otherwise they'll be brittle, and that's what reinforcement learning is really all about. It is about adaptive and autonomous agents. In that sense, actually, we often use robotics as a motivation for why one would want reinforcement learning. Uh, but the reality is that we don't actually use a lot of reinforcement learning yet in robotics. So one of the reasons that we don't use reinforcement learning for robotics that much yet is because there's this view that reinforcement learning is not that sample efficient. So you need lots and lots of data to actually get our agents to do anything reasonable. What is an example of how reinforcement learning can be used in the real world? Well, let's pick a really simple example of something that you may actually have seen in your own home, which could be something like a vacuum cleaning robot. Each home is going to be quite different from other homes, so you want to have an adaptive agent that can actually learn from trial and error interaction in that home how it should most efficiently vacuum that home. So in that setting, a reward might actually be something like the amount of dirt that is picked up because you want your agent to actually be rewarded for accomplishing its task, which is removing dirt from the ground. And you might actually also give it a reward for doing it in the smaller amount of time. So you might give it a negative reward, so you might penalize it a little bit if it uses too much energy or if it's running too long. So then what you would hope is that that agent in that new environment, every home is different, would be able to learn just from that reward signal and actually wandering around the environment and measuring information about the world. Um, so taking in that information, the agent can try to adapt to that environment and become better at vacuuming your house.
So let's talk off policy learning. What is it exactly and what are some of your key observations in this area? Well, let me actually first tell you what is off policy learning. So you're the agent, you're wandering around in the world uh, and we like to call this the behavior policy. So it's deciding how to behave. And now off policy learning means you would like to learn about a policy different or off of the one that you're actually following. So a lot of reinforced learning used to be about you know, what is the value or what are the properties of the policy I'm currently executing. But we would like to know if I had done something differently, if I had run this other policy, what are the value, what's the value of that policy or what would happen if I ran that policy. And also in an intuitive sense, it's really about what if questions. You know, I did this thing, but what if I had done this thing? Would it have been better? And if you can answer a what if questions, it's going to be a lot easier to make decisions and help you predict more what you should do into the future. In your representation learning work, you've said that one of the things that's missing is a way to learn representations incrementally that are stable. What are some of the directions that are promising uh, for learning representations incrementally? In a standard machine learning setting, you get this big batch of data often, and it's IID data, there's no temporal relations between them, and it's typically stationary. And so the, we don't have the same issues with having learning representation that has forgetting problems or learning representation that's not going to be stable because we don't necessarily have to learn it incrementally from one stream of data. And now when you move to the reinforcement learning setting, you have an agent that's moving around in its environment. If you're in this you know, big grid world and your agent is around moving around in this part of the space and as a result it sees one type of data for quite some time and then it comes down to this part of the space and sees a lot of this type of data for some amount of time and that's going to overwrite a lot of what's actually learned in your function approximator. So it's not always physical spatial relationships but there's this grouping of data that you're going to see when you have an agent that interacts and slowly expands into different parts of its world. So one property that I think is really important is locality. We want to have a representation say um, this is a local region of the space, I'm going to be updating my function approximator here and as you start moving to different parts of the space, you might actually want to keep this function approximator fixed or not change it too much and have a different function approximator learn for different parts of the space. So you can kind of start having these local models. Sparsity is one way to try to get local models and in general there's this definition called distributed representations that try to identify important latent attributes that different observations have and when you can identify those latent attributes, different parts of the world only have a small number of those attributes and when you update your models, you're always only updating small components and those components are only about attributes that are shared. So you're not overwriting completely old information. What are some of your thoughts on how we should design these behavior policies? And in particular, um, does this go beyond the normal explore versus exploit policy? If we imagine a single task setting, which has been a common paradigm in reinforcement learning, you have some problem. Like you'd like to make your agent go and pick up that ball and put it in the basketball hoop. And so that's a single task you'd like it to accomplish and it needs to actually move around in its world and figure out how it's going to do that. You know, one time it'll try to pick up the ball, maybe it gets reward for picking up the ball, but it has to actually figure out how to get to that ball to see that that's a good thing to do. So explore exploit is all about the agent would like to do the optimal thing right away. You want to get as much reward as it can from its environment, but it also needs to explore enough to know that it hasn't settled on some suboptimal policy. On off policy learning, we imagine that usually the behavior policy is not necessarily trying to solve some single task in the world. The behavior policy is wandering around and exploring so it can learn about many different things. So you might actually pick a behavior policy not to solve a single task and get lots of reward. Rather, you might pick it so that you can learn about a bunch of what-if questions. So if you'd like to know what would happen if I were to walk, you know, turn to the left and go to that door, then your exploration policy or behavior policy might actually go and do that thing because it has, doesn't have very much information in that part of the space. Or maybe it has three questions that all have to do with you know, that part of the world over there. And it's already learned about a bunch of what if questions about this part of the world. So it might prioritize going and gathering information to learn about things it doesn't know yet. So in that sense, the behavior policy is going to focus a little bit more on how can I improve my learning progress. There's all these different words around this idea of intrinsic motivation of learning progress, curiosity, surprise. Thank you so much for being here and talking RL and robots and what robots are and aren't. And we cannot wait to see where the field is going. You're welcome.